Welcome to another edition of Zeke in Action. I'm your host, Richard Baitlick, and today's broadcast will cover interpreting cyber threat intelligence reports. Before I get into the content of the video, I hope that you will like and subscribe to this channel. I usually forget to say these things, so I hope that uh, if you're not already subscribed, uh, that you do so, and I hope you find the content of this video useful. Cyber threat intelligence reports. I, I am in intelligence officer in the Air Force, or at least I was trained to be one and did that job for several years. I'm not a big fan of the term cyber threat intelligence. I find some of that to be internally redundant. However, it is the term by which our field refers to uh, the process of understanding what adversaries are doing in order to help prevent their activities in the future, or at least detect and respond to them when they are uh, trying to compromise our digital uh, value. So, there are many sources of free cyber threat intelligence reports uh, available, and I wanted to spend some time in this video talking about one that I find to be very useful. So let's get into that. The source that we're going to look at today is called the DFIR report, and DFIR uh, stands for Digital Forensics and Incident Response. Um, this is a, a group of individuals who periodically publish reports that they have written about intrusions that they have worked on in the field. Uh, they don't reveal the identities of the victims. They don't spend uh, really any time talking about who they are. However, their reports have a lot of good value and a lot of information that can be useful to someone who is using Zeek to try to detect and respond to activity in their own environment. So what I thought I would do is take a look at a few of these reports and give you a sense of what you can derive from these reports and apply to the data that you're collecting with Zeek. Before I look at an individual report, we need to keep in mind the type of information that you can extract from the network so that when we're looking at these reports, we know what we can and what we, we can't do. Uh, so for that reason, I would like to briefly just look at the four types of network security monitoring data. And uh, we have gone over this in a previous video, but just briefly to show, that, show it here, um, Zeek provides certain types of network security monitoring data, and then you can supplement it with, with other collection mechanisms. So for example, full content data is one type of NSM data. Zeek does not provide it, but you can collect it with other means, whether simply using TCP dump or uh, Marty Resch's daemon logger or whatever other uh, tool you might be using. Extracted content refers to ripping files out of traffic, whether it's a portable executable file or the contents of a website or whatever it is. Uh, that is something Zeek can do, also uh, something Suricata can do. IDS alerts, that's the third type of NSM data. Generally, when you think of IDS alerts, you're going to be using an IDS engine like Suricata or Snort. Uh, Zeek can provide judgments or alerts uh, to a certain extent, but it's really not the focus of the system. So if you're looking for IDS alerts, which I recommend that you do, um, I would recommend something like Suricata. And then finally, if you're looking for the richest collection of transaction logs that are available, this is where Zeek really shines. So for example, a connection log, the HTTP.log, a files log, PE log, all these other rich protocol specific logs that you can get uh, from Zeek straight out of the box or the box that you build with yourself when you set Zeek up. Um, these are the types of, of uh, logs that you can get that, that represent the transaction format. So you'll notice none of this is really host-based. Right? This isn't, we're not looking at memory, we're not looking at artifacts from a system. Uh, in the case of a PE log, that is potentially the portable executable that was transferred from one system to another. So although it ends up on the host, uh, you may have a record of it. Uh, in fact, you may even have the PE file itself if you set up Zeek to extract it, or you may have it in the, the, the uh, full content data. So with that in mind, Let's go back to our reports and see what we can have. So here is a DFI report. If you want to follow them on Twitter, that's probably the easiest way to sort of keep up with what they're doing. Uh, their handle is just the DFIR report, easy to find. When you go to their website, you'll see that they periodically post these stories. So you know, here we have a couple in April, there's one recently in May. I'm gonna take a look at a few that caught my attention and see what we have. 
Now there's two ways to sort of use these reports. Uh, one way is to simply shoot to the end of the report and look for the information that they provide that would help you find similar activity in your environment. And there's usually a heading of something like indicators or IOCs or something like that. So if I just do a search for, say, IOCs, that didn't work. Let's look for indicators. Here we go. Indicators, this is near the end of the report. And they will give you certain bits of information that would help you find this activity in your environment. So you have some IP addresses here. You have some domains. You have user agents that might appear in the HTTP.log. These are all the network indicators that they offer. These are bits of information that could directly be used if searching your Zeek logs. Now, if you were to simply look for the IP address 148.251.71.182, you haven't read the report yet. You don't know e even what's going on in this, in this report. So that's why it's always important to have context when you're, when you're trying to understand what's written in an intelligence report like this. It doesn't make any sense to go searching for this IP address or for this domain or a user agent um, without knowing what the significance is because otherwise you're just sort of poking around and if you find something, it may or may not be bad. I mean, who knows? So with that in mind, let's scroll back up and take a look at the content of this report and see what it's trying to describe. So the headline is APT35 automates initial access using proxy shell. What this means is there is a threat group that is called APT35. The APT designator is something that Mandiant popularized in the 2000s. Uh, they use a, num a numerical system, so APT35 was, was simply the 35th group uh, that they gave the APT uh, assignment to. You'll you see other terms. Uh, CrowdStrike has its own naming convention. Microsoft has their own naming convention. Uh, many organizations have different naming conventions, and we're not. This isn't the time to talk about why that is, although you know, there are good reasons for it. So the next thing we see is uh, a mention of Proxy Shell. So Proxy Shell was a set of vulnerabilities affecting Microsoft Exchange uh, last year, and who knows, potentially earlier. Um, and then we see uh, a mention of initial access. So when I read these reports, I always like to understand how did the intruder first get access to the victim? Because if you can find that initial activity, that gives you the biggest lead time from when the intruder got into the environment and when they accomplished their mission, whatever, whatever it could be, whether it's installing ransomware, whether it's uh, setting up long-term presence for persistent uh, collection against you, whether it's for stealing a specific set of data, whether it's for changing a value, whatever the case is. So I always like to see if there's a way to to find out when they first, got, not only when they first got into the system, but how they first got into the system. So um, we've got a little bit of a case summary here. Um, we see this mentioned that threat actors, that the threat actors activity occurred in two bursts within a three day uh, time frame. This points to another aspect of threat intel reports that I'm very interested in is the overall time. Every time metric I can grab, I take a look at. And then uh, occasionally when these reports uh, appear, I will retweet them with the key metrics that I derived from the report. Um, and I use the hashtag time centric security. Time is one of the few metrics that we can really do something with in security, in my opinion. A lot of the others aren't very actionable, but if you have, an if you have a sense of how fast an adversary acts or how slow an adversary acts, it can help guide your own defensive uh, mechanisms. Uh, so we see here, as with our previous case, they started by uploading their web shell and disabling antivirus services. Okay, that doesn't tell us anything, honestly, um, because how, did they, how were they able to upload their web shell? Um, so here above the case summary, it says we observe the initial exploitation of the proxy shell vulnerabilities. So, uh, you know, this stuff here should probably be in case summary or the, the initial, initial exploitation should be mentioned in the case study, because if you just go straight to the case summary, there's no mention of how they first got access. It's up here. So just a minor report writing issue, I suppose. But if you say, okay, the first way they got in was proxy shell vulnerabilities. Uh, they worked over a three day time frame. 
and then they uploaded their web shells and disabled antivirus services. After that, they established two persistence mechanisms or two persistence methods. So here I would want to know where are they coming from when they're doing the activity? What does their persistence mechanism look like? Do they go back to the same IP address? Um, are they using a service? Like a, are they communicating via some covert, covert channel that uses uh, a well-known property like something owned by Google or Microsoft or uh, IRC or whatever. So I'm going to be wanting to look for that. Um, so they have a they have a case summary. Um, okay, now we this is where I start to to really make good use of these reports in my opinion. Some of the stuff up here I'm not a big fan of how this, they've written this, um, but they usually provide a time. Uh, a time graphic and this is really really helpful in my opinion because it kind of for it, honestly it forces the writer to be clear about what they're what they're saying um, writing these reports is a real art in itself um, the Mandia consultants learn a specific way to do it that Kevin Mandia taught to them and as a result the reports are really pretty consistent and tight and uh, make a lot of sense so when you're forced to do a timeline you're kind of put into that discipline as well so I always uh, pay quick uh, I pay a lot of attention to the timeline so here we see uh, day one whichever day this was at 1529 UTC and using UTC for all your t uh, times is a great idea um, you see that uh, proxy shell exploitation took place and the web shell was uploaded and I also like the way that they break down these reports and they're providing the main activity and then they give you additional details off to the side I think that's a nice um, a nice convention to use. So we see at 1529, there's the initial exploitation via uh, the proxy shell vulnerabilities. And then we see the execution of this PowerShell, um, or we see execution of PowerShell via this web shell. This is the web shell over here, uh, a minute later. And then we see all the activities that took place. So disabling of Windows Defender, uh, creating a scheduled task to download DLL, host TXE, da, 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 all this stuff. Enabling RDP on the server, downloading the fast reverse proxy. So from the perspective of Zeek and the Zeek data that I'm interested in, I'm wondering what of this can I see? Now there's going to be a con log uh, for this activity uh, to, the, to the server. So we're going to have that. I don't know whether proxy shell will give us anything. I, you know, I'm not uh, familiar with how they, the adversary used it in this mechanism. Uh, but we're going to see con log activity here. Now the fact that they enabled RDP on the server makes me think, oh, well, they're going to connect later via RDP. So we might have some RDP logs that we could look at in Zeek as well. All the stuff that happens on the host, the um, uh, adding a default account, uh, disabling LSA protection, disabling Windows Defender, unless you have a mechanism to decode and interpret the C2 channel that the adversaries are using to execute these commands, Via Zeek, we're not going to see this host-based activity because it's happening on the system and Zeek is simply looking at the network traffic. This does give you uh, one reason why it's good to have network-based coverage, though, because if you're relying simply on your host-based coverage uh, to understand what's going on and the, and the intruder starts disabling the mechanisms that you use to track what's happening, then you're, you're kind of out of luck. At the same time, if the intruder is using encryption to foil your ability to see that C2, then all you know is that they're doing something on the system based on the amount of data that potentially could be transferred. Um, here we see another instance of proxy shell exploitation. I don't know if this is from a different system or to a different system. We also see uh, another execution of PowerShell. So that is the initial access graphic. And we can see that the overall time, um, this is interesting, right? This is the, the, the intro, the, the, the narrative talked about a three day period. Here we see on day one, they got access to this one system, did all this activity. And then uh, on day three, they did another set of activity. So let's see what else we could look in here just from a Zeek. Um, perspective. All of this child process, parent process stuff doesn't mean anything for us You're doing uh, network-based detections. Can't use any of it. Um, so this is interesting. The environment for this investigation had SSL inspection of PCAPs available for analysis. 
So that means that they were breaking, the, the victim was breaking and inspecting the SSL traffic and was recording traffic uh, in PCAP format, which is awesome. I mean, that is, especially going to the mail server, uh, that is pretty impressive. So what that means is they were able to grab, here we can see this HTTP traffic, this post and so forth. So this is uh, straight up uh, PCAP and rendered via Wireshark. Uh, Zeek would have an HTTP.log for this. And any files that were transferred, if that were configured, you would get that as well. Here we see um, the mention of one of the IP addresses that appear later. So using this information, you have an idea of what the context was for the use of, of that IP address. Downloading and executing a fake DLL host. So this might be one of their the intruders' uh, logistics hosts or, or quartermaster hosts or staging hosts or whatever, where they have their tools loaded up and they use, the, they, they use them to host what they need when the intruder is going to access them for later. Uh, okay, anything else? Then look at persistence. Privilege escalation, not going to see that with the network. Credential access, not going to see it. Um, we're seeing the, uh, the post to the web shell because the intruder has uh, break and inspect. So again, this would appear in your, in your Zeek logs, which is pretty nice. None of this stuff would appear. It's all host-based. Um, yeah, okay. And then uh, here's C2. So we know that uh, here's some IP addresses and hosts that were appeared uh, at the bottom when we looked at it. And then finally, the exfiltration. Here's where they're posting to the web shell and they're pulling data back. All right, let's look at another one of these reports. Here's one from February. Qbot and zero login lead to full domain compromise. Uh, Qbot is a banking trojan that has been around for a while. And uh, here we have uh, zero login, which is another, uh, this is a two-year-old vulnerability, actually I get this at the time. Yeah, this is a two-year-old vulnerability back in 2020. Um, so let's take a look at this. We see uh, a summary of the threat actors gained initial access to a Windows workstation through the execution of a malicious DLL. So we don't know how the intruders got this DLL loaded. Uh, I th believe later on they talk about it's possible that it was delivered via uh, phishing or something like that. Um, you can't fault the investigators in this case. Uh, there may simply not be data available. So all they can say is, look, we see a, a malicious DLL was loaded, and from there on we have, we have information. So let's take a look uh, to our trust. Actually, let's first do our little trick here and see if there's any... Uh, what do they have for IOCs? Yeah, so if we just zip down to the bottom and you can see that it looks like for the QBot activity, they've got two IP addresses uh, and actually a port um, in each case. And they have a URL or sorry, a domain associated with each. And then for Cobalt Strike, which surprise, surprise, was used here for C2, um, they have the IP addresses and the ports and the uh, domain name that was used for uh, the Cobalt Strike C2. But going back up to the top, let's take a quick look at our timeline and see what we have. So we have uh, this all looks like it takes place on a single day because they only they don't mention day one, day two. Um, 1631 UTC, they see that there's this initial QBOT DLL execution. And they're saying on beachhead, meaning the initial system that the uh, intruder compromised. So that was where the intruder got a foothold. So just like they were storming Normandy, this is their, what they, the, the report here calls a beachhead. Um, so we see that this is how they know this was, it was re, uh, executed via run DLL 32. Um, six minutes later at 1637, we see the first C2 activity. And that means there's outbound or yeah, most likely outbound activity at this point. And there's a bunch of host stuff. Here we see um, Cobalt Strike being initiated, so 1646. So we've got 15 minutes after the initial activity, you've got Cobalt Strike. And then you've got more Cobalt Strike stuff happening. Um, something else I'd like to pay attention to here is uh, a metric that um, uh, Dimitri from, or X CrowdStrike, um, Dimitri Alperovich used to talk about uh, called breakout time. And that was the time that elapses between when the intruder gets first access to a system and when they get basically domain access. 
And so we have um, zero login exploit on the first domain controller and then a cobalt strike beacon installed on the domain controller. Um, let me see. Yeah, so I'm assuming that if they get access to the domain controller here at 1703 and they get Cobalt Strike installed seven minutes later, you're looking at just over a half an hour of breakout time. So from the initial access to this one system where this one DLL was loaded, and again, we don't know how they got that on there, but let's assume it happened right away. You're looking at about a half an hour of breakout time, which is really, really tough for Defender. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the best shops in the world try to shoot for about an hour of breakout time. Uh, I think CrowdStrike also calls that the golden hour, <laughs> where you need to get your act together and, and respond as fast as you can. It is really tough. Even if you're in the security 1%, um, there aren't that many shops who can act that fast. So to hear to see here that you've got potentially an intruder going from initial access to domain access within uh, half an hour, that's pretty rough. We see here a uh, mention of an RDP connection from the beachhead to the domain controller and a file server. So um, RDP is something that potentially you could see. Now this is where we should probably make a mention as well of what can you see uh, with your Zeek sensor regardless of the data types. What it is that w what can you actually see? So um, to just talk about that for a second I'm going to bring up this this slide. This is a a depiction of a very you know super simple network and your placement of your sensor will determine what you can see. So if I have for example um, a sensor that's located at this location um, watching this internal network, I'm not going to see internal systems talking to each other because I'm only able to see north-south traffic here if this is where my sensor is. Now if I, sp if I span something on this on this switch such that I can see traffic among internal systems and then I send that span traffic to that sensor, I could see lateral movement potentially. Now there's going to be a lot of traffic uh, I would imagine, but it may be the, you know, that might be what you decide is important to do. Now we, we don't know what the beachhead system was in this particular intrusion. So if the beachhead occurred in the DMZ and then the internal network was where the domain controller was, and sometimes people do that, they'll have a system in the DMZ uh, administered by a domain controller, you could see RDP traffic from the from the beachhead down to the domain controller because it is passing through that traffic or through that sensor, which is seeing that north south traffic right here. Um, similarly, if there was a, the victim in a wireless network and it came through this way, you would see that uh, traffic as well. But if you have multiple systems down here and you're simply watching north south, you're not going to see the activity. So. Um, you know, potentially Z could be very useful to you, but if a sensor isn't in the right location, then, you know, what are you going to do? All right, let's take a look at our third DFIR report, and then we'll call it a day here. This one is called From Zero to Domain Admin, um, starting, or this was published back in November, and it says, this report will go through an intrusion um, that began with an email, and so I like that. We know it started with an email and eventually ended up with, uh, yes, the usual suspect, Cobalt Strike. Of course, Cobalt Strike. Um, you've got some lateral movement here, and this is very, this is good. The threat actor was able to go from zero access to domain admin in just under one hour. So here we see, uh, this is exactly the type of, of metric I like to see. How fast did it take for the intruder to achieve breakout? Here it says just under one hour. Um, we have the initial access method, which uh, was an email. So let us take a look at, first let's just check and see other indicators. Of course there will be indicators, but let's just um, go to the end just to quickly see what we might have. Uh, so for this Hansator malware, we've got an IP address and a port. We've got uh, the HTTP site. Actually, we've got the whole URL there. Um, we've got an IP address and a domain, which is used to download the Cobalt Strike. Um, and then we have the Cobalt Strike C2 domain, where we have some, uh, I'm assuming these are user agents that were used. We've got a couple more IP addresses. And then we've got uh, where they downloaded this agent1.ps1, an IP address, a port, and a user agent. But let's go back up top, and let's see if we have a 
Timeline. Yes, we do have a timeline. So at 16.30, we have uh, Hansator, which was executed via Word. And a minute later, we have our first uh, Cobalt Strike activity. So again, this is uh, something that would appear in your con log. And depending on if they used port 80 um, and used HTTP, not encrypted, you would get just basic Zeek, you would get HTTP logs. If they ended up using SSL over port 443, you would have to, you would not have HTTP logs unless you do break and inspect, but you would have all your uh, SSL logs and um, all of those uh, sorts of, that, those sorts of logs that provide potentially information on the server. Um, if you're using J3, you might have information on, on different hashes and such. Um, so we next have domain and local admin recon. So the intruder is trying to find the domain controller so that they can get uh, domain access. Here we see um, a few minutes later, we have a second cobalt strike beacon. We see more lateral movement. Again, this lateral movement would be visible if you can see activity among your systems and not simply that, that north-south traffic. This is kind of interesting. Here we see um, computer discovery via ICMP. Uh, so <laughs> there's probably a decent amount of ICMP on everybody's network, but to actually see someone trying to use ICMP to find systems in an age where there's so many like host-based firewalls and middle boxes and all this kind of stuff, um, that might be something that would <laughs> might possibly stand out if you, see, if you see somebody doing like a ping sweep against all these systems, uh, unless it's your, your friendly neighborhood uh, vulnerability assessment team or your red team, um, seeing someone do that would be, be pretty obvious. Unfortunately, it only takes uh, f uh, four minutes for <laughs> from that ICMP uh, activity to seeing the final lateral movement to the file server where they install Cobalt Strike. So uh, that wouldn't give you a whole lot of time to, to do anything with that. So I think that's a good place to stop. And I hope that Looking at these sorts of reports gives you an idea of the kind of data that you can get from three, uh, excuse me, from free threat intel sources. Uh, again, these DFI reports are published, you know, uh, usually monthly, sometimes more often, and uh, I, I just think they're great. Uh, I think it's great that there are incident responders out there who will publish material of this quality that you can simply download and read. Uh, you know, all of the, the indicators might not be something that you need directly. Uh, I tend to use these reports more to find out what intruders are doing, because if they start doing something that is completely novel, that we have no coverage for, then that gets me worried. But if they're using, at least in the, in the reports that we see here, uh, mechanisms, uh, TTPs that are reflected by our defensive capabilities, then we'll be okay will say, okay, I think I have a way to detect this sort of activity. And that's honestly what I'm always trying to find when uh, I'm reading any type of reporting is, is do we see some type of uh, breakthrough approach that will defeat the detection response mechanisms that we have uh, in place when using something uh, like Zeek? So with that, I would like to thank you for uh, watching this episode of Zeek in Action and Int interpreting cyber threat intelligence reports. Uh, please remember, if you like this content, um, feel free to leave a comment on the video. Uh, I read the, the comments every day and respond to them as best I can. Uh, feel free to join our Slack uh, channel. And we're also uh, doing some exciting improvements to the mailing list, so you'll see that uh, coming out pretty soon. Um, at the time of recording, it's uh, it's uh, the I think it's the it's early May, so this video should come out in a few days anyway. Um, so hopefully uh, the new mailing list will be available shortly. And uh, Slack is a great place to hang out as well to get questions answered. There's a lot of uh, very talented people who are there who are happy to help um, you understand how to use Zeek, you know, to the best of our ability as well. So with that. Um, I'd like to thank you for watching this video and please subscribe to see the next videos uh, when they come out. Thank you.